All right, so today we're going to talk about a book that's available online, a, a series of essays called Reclaiming Natural Manhood. Uh, this was written before Guerrero, but there's a significant amount of overlap and a couple interesting insights. So I just wanted to review briefly, well, I wanted to re uh, review maybe 10 points uh, about the book. And uh, I'm going to provide the links to everything below. So if you want to follow along or, you know, if anything catches your interest, you can. That is a rant. Okay. So if anything follows uh, or any, anything strikes your interest, then just look it up, uh, click through and look it up. So we have, uh, the, the book begins with, uh, with saying masculinity, the male gender, uh, and it differentiates between social masculinity and natural masculinity. Social masculinity being the kind of um, culturally acquired stereotypes of masculinity. But at the same time, though, unlike a lot of people in the West who are very politically correct, he doesn't say that all masculinity is made up. He just says that he acknowledges that there's an innate gender, but, uh, but society uh, puts some extra attributes on top of that. And that's right. So we go to the, so we go to the second part of it, uh, or uh, we go to male gender roles, the second point I'm making here. What are male, 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 what are male gender roles? Now, if you read through this section, uh, you realize that this guy is not talking about he-man kind of bullshit, which is a, what a lot of masculinity passes for. Uh, so he does critique masculinity, the kind of stereotypical masculinity, but he doesn't say that, well, therefore all masculinity is made up. So, for example, he says, he quotes, real men don't cry, only wimps do. And it's very interesting because this guy lives in India, and this is basically the cultural messaging that we get here in the West as well. That is a rat, if you can hear it. Real men don't cry, only wimps do. We have all been subjected to such comments since childhood. What is expected and what is not expected of us as males have been hammered into our heads. What are we going to be? How, uh, how are we going to dress? What hobbies are we going to take up? What attitudes are we going to have? What behaviors? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's, uh, we absorb this from the social environment around us. And one thing that he really talks about is, uh, is that men do have emotions. You know, that men do have emotions. And this is, this is contrasted to something like uh, the book Androphilia, which I review in chapter 12. And what we say in this culture and apparently in the other culture is men shouldn't have emotions. You know, and what I've always looked at is this is very manipulative because this is really just to serve abusers and to keep abusers blameless. So let's say, uh, just as an extreme example, so we understand the principle, let's say if I punch you in the face as hard as I can, and then I say, well, real men don't whine and complain about being punched in the face. Well, that serves me because I can keep punching you in the face because when you say, wait a second, I don't like being punched in the face. Then I can say, well, you're not a real man, you pussy. Okay. So the whole purpose of men not having emotions is to make them, uh, uh, to, to keep them abused. Because you're not going to speak up if speaking up is defined as you're not masculine, you see. All right. Now, let's see. I think that's point number two. Yes, yes. So uh, number three would be. So just to just to read a little bit from the book, just to give a little sample. All men cry, even if we, even if, only, even if only when alone. We have emotions and we feel them deeply. We are not always aggressive. We submit to others at times. We feel scared. We feel inadequate. We fall sick and we also feel pain. Uh, blah blah blah. So point number three would be that now that he's introduced the idea that a lot of masculinity is made up. He's also going to say, well, what part of male sexuality is made up by culture as well? Okay. So he's kind of softened up the audience by saying, ah, see, a lot of masculinity is made up. And then he introduces the idea that a lot of heterosexuality in men is made up. Okay, so male sexual roles, uh, point number three here would be pressure to suppress sexual need for men. So he's kind of coy about it. He doesn't say... Like me on Grero, uh, you know, most Roman emperors had sex with other men. You're not straight. Everyone has a bisexual potential. He doesn't just trumpet that the first uh, second you see the site, but he kind of softens people up. So that's the difference in strategy here. Um, 
Now, this idea that male sexual roles are made up, uh, that, uh, that they're constructed by culture, this goes under the name of heterosexualization. He uses this a lot. A lot of people use this in, in uh, the literature a lot. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I use it in Grero per se, but the concept that I use uh, is in Chapter 8, passively acquired cultural trait. So a lot of, um, or, or at least a similar line of thinking you can find in my book on Chapter 8. So let's see. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the points I wanted to make for point number three. Uh -huh. Yes, so point number four. Uh, so point number four is pressure to suppress sexual need for men. So this is where he introduces the concept that actually one of the things in, in culture uh, that is made up is that men shouldn't like other men. And he's not saying, oh, those, those gays, the 2% of the population, they should be free to have uh, sex with other men. He's saying most men should be free to have sex with other men. And that's part of the cultural construction of masculinity. And that, and that innately men would be having sex with other men. Uh, let's see. Right, and let me just uh, read a little sample here. In male-only groups where complete suppression of such feelings is impossible, that is the innate feeling that men have for other men that is suppressed in this culture, and most people would say, oh, well, that doesn't even exist. Uh, so suppression of such feelings is impossible in all male groups. Men keep getting emotionally and sexually attached to other men. So like military or uh, military or all male groups like that boarding schools. Having casual but superficial sex between them in such male only groups is fairly easy while sleeping or bathing together, etc. Uh, boarding schools, like uh, if you read in Chapter 5, I quoted from Christopher Hitchens, that would be one example. Masculinity roles allow such acts as long as they are not given much importance, are kept secret, and are camouflaged by an acceptable excuse. So, oh, there's no women around. A men do have an acceptable excuse in such circumstances that they, they do not have women. Well, I guess uh, great minds think alike. Uh, however, men don't allow themselves to love other men because such an emotional attachment is forbidden by social masculinity. So it's okay to, you know, suck dick every once in a while as long as you have an excuse, but you're not loving it. No, it's just horniness or something, right? Uh, in traditional societies, however, intense sexual emotional bonds persist in the guise of deep friendships. Okay, so let's see. Well, the point I wanted to make... Right, so this is, this is very much like the concept of situational homosexuality we have here in the West, that when, when you can't deny that men have sex with other men because there's two men having sex, you say, oh, it's just situational. They, they don't have women. Or, and of course, the fact that it has to be kept secret, that's just uh, our concept of down low. You know, uh, one example of, of the down low would be, as I said, Christopher Hitchens, or if you read the other story in Chapter 5, The Most Beatific Look. You know, uh, it's, it's allowed as long as no one knows about it. Now, when it's found out, then everybody has to act like it's the worst thing in the world and then break that relationship. So he also says here, there's an implicit understanding between men in such bonds that everything will be done quietly under an excuse. Well, just the point I've made. All right, let's see. Point number five would be, oh, this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, so he says, male need for intimacy with another man is a reality and cannot be washed away. Suppressing this important human instinct harms men in a number of ways. For one, it breaks man for man. A typical heterosexualized man is unable to relate with another man at any significant level. In modern heterosexual societies, deep friendships between men have become a thing of the past. And that's, you know, in broken from each other, men have become isolated and vulnerable, unable to protect even their most basic interests in society. So, yeah, that, that certainly is what I've noticed is, is, is it's very difficult to have, even if we're talking non-sexual, it's very difficult to have a friendship with another male because if it becomes a little more deeper, then it's, oh, well, it's a bunch of homos. That's why you have the word no homo, which I've done a video about, is every time men get a little closer together, even if it's non-sexual, it's, oh, it's no homo. Or you have the word bromance, uh, which is just an abomination I can't stand. You know, it's, it's trying to belittle it. And again, it doesn't have to have anything sexual to it. But you, you know that even if there's nothing sexual to it, it will be belittled. And, oh, they're having a little romance. Well, it's just nonsense. And what if they are? What would be the problem with that? You know? 
And and uh, this is this, I've done a video on speedos. I'm going to do another one on it. Um, this is where the speedo the speedo phobia comes from, which is a word I just made up. You know, you don't want men showing off the fact that they have genitalia, okay? Because it's noticeable and there's just this awkwardness that gets built up around it. So you must hate it, okay? You must laugh laugh about it. Uh, you're not attracted to it, etc. Now. And of course, when same-sex sex does occur between men, then you, you excuse it as situational homosexuality. And what I want to do with Guerrero is, is not to say that all male friendships can evolve into sexuality. I, I don't think it can. I mean, I'm not attracted to most of the uh, male friends I've had, even in high school. However, right now, you can't have any friendships that turn into... Uh, that turn into sexuality okay and that's what bromance no homo and all these things want to do they want to they want to ignore and and squash the mere possibility that a friendship could turn into something more than that okay so Guerrero aims to break down the wall between friends and love because right now there's a wall and you just hit it hit up hit up against it and say people say oh no homo bromance and all this other nonsense Okay, and, and just to look back at the Germans that we talked about, Adolf Brand and, and whatnot, in German, one of the words for, for love, uh, for the kind of love that I'm describing here was, uh, my great German is going to pronounce it as a uh, Liebe, uh, love between friends. Okay, that's exactly what I'm aiming for here. And again, it's not, you must fuck every one of your friends, uh, but it's that the possibility is there, and it should not be, it, should, it shouldn't be awkward. And it should be discussed openly. And if people want to have romantic relationships with their friends, then that should be something that's open for discussion, and um, something that is that's something that people will do. That's what Guerrero tries to do, and I think that's what this guy's trying to do here too. Uh, let's see. I might have a couple more minutes. Let's see here. Oh, okay. Let, let me make one last point in this video, and I'll continue it. Point number six. He has an essay called uh, The Invisible Power of Women, and he makes the point that women intrude on men's spaces and that that intrusion itself creates a kind of heterosexualization where men become only interested in, in women uh, sexually. And, you know, I can kind of confirm this. So there's a dating site called OkCupid, and you can register, if you're a male, you can register as, as straight, bisexual, or gay. Now, I've noticed that whenever I put that I'm straight and only looking for women, lots of women email me, right? Lots of women. So I put I'm straight, same picture, same everything, lots of women email me. Now, when I change my orientation, yeah, I'm not a fan of the word, but if I change that to bisexual or, or male looking for both or whatever, what ends up happening is the amount, you, you would expect that if we lived in a society where there wasn't an issue with this, that not only would I get the same amount of women that I had before, but I also would get bisexual and gay men, right? So I would have a base of women plus whatever's on top of that if I choose to put bisexuality there. What actually ends up happening is the amount of, of women drastically goes down. Now, of course, the amount of men who message me goes up. You know, thank you very much, gays. But, uh, you know, but the point is the women go down. So... A lot of women have a problem with with, uh, with same sex uh, sex uh, on the part of their uh, their men, and that that encourages men to only seek out women, because if they seek out both, they actually decrease the amount of potential partners they have. Uh, also, uh, relating to invisible power of women, you, you hear all these feminists talking about how you know men are oppressive, and they can be. You can have guys who beat the crap out of women. But what I've always noticed is is that uh, for for men who are under the age of 12, they're surrounded by women. Uh, the caretakers at home will most likely be women, and if they and if you go to school, the the teachers will be women there. You know, they're going to be against uh, the masculine sort of games, the more rough and tumble play that boys have. So I, I've never understood this idea of oh the patriarchy as well. Everyone in society that uh, has power over you, if you're under 18, is a woman teachers, your mother, etc. So anyways, we'll continue point seven, eight, nine, ten after this.